Good afternoon, Martin Campbell. Good afternoon. How are you doing? All right. I'm doing very well, thank you. That's I was just watching, uh, just watching the, the latest documentary of uh, Tiger Woods there, so looking forward to getting back to that. That'll be, uh, that'll be a bit spicy, I would imagine, is it? I don't know how, but he's probably quite politically correct nowadays. I think he's learned well, to well, apparently the, the chat is that he didn't, uh, he's not too happy with this one because there's a few bits about his, uh, sort of some of the past that he's not uh, yeah. too proud of. Uh, yeah, not too proud of and that he wouldn't want uh, sort of out in the media too much. But I guess I always thought these guys would have final cut on things like this, but it probably gets to a point where uh, the media will just do what they want. And if it sells, then uh, they're going to be happy doing that. I know, I know. You wouldn't. They want to have control, but it doesn't make great TV when they have control, do they? It doesn't make great media. I don't think when you, uh, no. as you say, they must have to sign disclaimers to say, no, no, we'll, we'll decide, kind of thing, right? So, well, I heard a lot of that with uh, the Jordan one. So I don't know if you saw the the Last Dance. So that's that's a cracking documentary. Uh, but apparently, there was a lot more that Jordan wasn't happy about uh, releasing. So. There's the edited version that probably makes him look to be a bit better than uh, he necessarily was to some of his teammates, but maybe we'll get that one day. We'll get that unedited. Who was, who was that edited. documentary? Who was that documentary right then? Who was it? Mike McGordon. Oh, was it? Was it? Well, okay. Yeah. Good. I'm yeah. surprised you've not heard of it because uh, I get it was it was released when we all went into lockdown, so I think tactically it was perfect timing uh, to capture everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so on the badminton, I'm I'm conscious of time. I've got literally got forty minutes, so um, and it, it does fly by. So what I'd like to focus on really is I've got kind of a plan. Um, obviously, I've interviewed a lot of older people like Douglas Walker and um, okay. Andy Cook. Yeah, I know, and Andy Cook yesterday. So they've got. I think I'm up to. I was saying to Andy yesterday. I think I might be one of episode three. Maybe the maybe another two. So uh, with yeah, him. Yeah. So it's um, but it's just different with yourself. So I just interviewed Jordan Hart. That was good, um, but it's just a kind of a very different conversation when it's when you're younger, I suppose. When you and especially like professional players as well. Um, so I'm trying to. I would like to just focus on the kind of a that I'll kind of split it into three sections, being the past, the present, and the future, I suppose. Um, so we'll start with the first question. Your full name. <laughs> full name: Martin Robert Campbell. And where did Robert come from? Do you know? So um, my dad's dad, so granddad. Oh, Bert. What's that? Bert. Bert. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bert. I spoke. Obviously, I've interviewed your dad, right? Bert Campbell. Everybody knew him in uh, Four Trolls as the. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sad, sadly, I never, I never got to meet him. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure he would have loved uh, seeing the journey uh, from myself and Michael. So. Yeah, that was a shame, but yeah, that, that's where it comes from. When did he pass? It was a long time ago. Or? Uh, just just before I was born. Oh, I'm so sorry. Not, not not long before. So he was, uh, obviously, he was obviously quite a man. I was saying to your dad, he was obviously very instrumental in a lot of badminton played in your family. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my before I guess you're probably going to ask about it, but my whole uh, starting in badminton is through through my dad's side of the family with him playing. Him playing so much and all his brothers playing, so that's that's how I naturally we'll, went into we'll, that. We'll definitely come to that. So, um, your <laughs> age, Martin? So thirty now. Just recently. Uh, July time. So uh, obviously celebrations were a little bit muted in comparison to what we'd have liked them to be, but still managed to. It was at a point where we still had a we were allowed. To, we got back to a little bit of normality, so right. I still managed to. Uh, and see some friends and family and uh, have that. So I wasn't in total lockdown. So at least I was thankful to to, to sell, still celebrate a little. A little, a little open. Um, so the your home <laughs> area is Edinburgh, right? Yeah, so originally from Edinburgh, yeah. But I live in Glasgow. Do you still have family in Fort Rose? So not in Fort Rose specifically, but we have... So a lot of uh, my dad's brothers moved down to... Edinburgh or Glasgow, but one of his brothers still lives up in the Black Isle. Really? Uh, so up north. So only not not as many as before, but on my other side of the family, my mum's parents and my grandma and granddad, they live up in Torfins, which is oh, really? northeast coast. So 
and got aunts and uncles. So a lot of a lot of our family originated are where from the Black Isle. Is that that what it's called? The Black Isle, is it? The Black yeah, that's my dad's side. So my mom's side's more Bankery area near Aberdeen. Oh really? Yeah. South south of Scotland. (laughs) In, yeah, in, in, yeah. Relative, in relative them, terms, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've got, is it just yourself and Michael? Yeah, so, yeah, one brother, Michael. What is the age difference, Martin? Two years and two days. Wow. And, yeah. and um, did, you, did you grow up playing together against each other? Yeah, I mean, we probably, initially when we were younger, two years was quite a big gap. So when you're like under 13, under 15, yeah. that is still quite a big gap. But I think as you get closer to senior level uh, and then in seniors, it doesn't make a difference. So at that point, yeah, we would train together. So we had a few years where we'd have both been part of the national setup training together in at Scotstown. So we came across, I think, a couple of times at the nationals. So... Uh, probably, if I'm honest, not obviously the nicest situation to play in, but you just got to forget that it's your brother and uh, stay unemotional and uh, yeah. just get, get the job done. But it's probably not the nicest for mum and dad to to watch uh, having us both play each other. But we also trained together a lot. We had a year at Loughborough together as well, so oh, he, he he went down to Loughborough as well. And did you did he did you? <laughs> When did you start? Let's go. Let me go back. Um, what age when you started playing? So, probably around about six, seven. That that's our age. Pretty pretty young. I mean, just because my dad played so much, I would have been around uh, watching him play uh, and going to tournaments or watching county matches. And and I think naturally, just from that, probably picked up a racket. As, as soon as I could, and but in terms of actually probably properly playing with him, maybe around about that age. So, when you were when your dad <laughs> going to tournaments and stuff like that, and there's a long day, right? Going to a tournament, and you know you're six and seven years old. I guess it's boring, right? Um, yeah. Then, at the time, did you not want to go? <laughs> do you remember? I mean, I can't remember too much, but I do remember. You'll you'll probably kill me for saying this, but <laughs> one of my vivid memories of watching him play was going to, uh, I think it was a county match and seeing him break a racket because he's, he's a competitive man. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, I'm sure they, he broke a racket and I, I remember just being so surprised by it. Uh, <laughs> but it was pretty cool to see because I've always just seen him very calm. Are you talking, and... when you say break a racket, are you talking about <laughs> made a mistake and then smashed the racket? Or are you talking about, yeah, colliding with somebody? You're talking about uh, him, uh, him making a mistake. Part. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, <laughs> the first one. Yeah. You don't remember the game, or who was playing against, or what the event know. was. I can't remember the game. I can't remember the game. What age were you? Was that when you were like six and seven? Was it? I must have been a little bit older than that. Eh, I'm sure, but that that was one of my memories. It's funny how that sticks with you. Eh, <laughs> but I also remember I'm having a good a good win at the East of Scotland. So my my uncle Ian he runs the East of Scotland tournament. So yes, we would always sure. go down. And watch that. So I remember he had a good win against uh, Andy Bowman and Jamie Neal, who were like the top top juniors coming through. I think just coming through as senior. And I always remind Andy of it, but he's he's in denial that he ever lost that game. <laughs> uh, Andy ended up. I used to train with Andy, and then he ended up being my coach. Really? Uh, so <laughs> so I like bringing that up with him. So I love that. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Still in denial. I like that. So from then, um, why and where did you start playing? So you've obviously, when did you start playing? Did you go to, do you have a club? Did you get coaching? Was your dad just taking you down to a sports hall? What was it? So initially it would have just been my mum and my dad uh, probably just hitting with hitting with them a lot. And then as I maybe got a little bit older, joins uh, clubs like Tall Oaks with Bob Mackay, uh, Douglas Walker has his sessions on a Tuesday night oh, down at Western Hills. Yeah, we were Western Hills. Uh, Sight Hill, yeah, that was uh, Tall Oaks. And then Irene Blair yes. as well, yeah. her sessions. Uh, and then just naturally as you progress, maybe like some county squads and then maybe getting a little bit more serious, uh, doing sort of trying to get some individual coaching with so Kenny Middlemas. 
was my first uh, and my main coach really through my junior career. And then, so when did you when did you think? Obviously, you were going with your dad. So how many times a week did you play back then? When it, at what age did you start playing very very regularly? Like, uh, probably I remember starting to play tournaments at under ten. Well, so yeah. I I reckon. I reckon probably at that age, maybe three or four times, but then it really started to ramp up when I was 12 or 13, uh, when they, they started the Junior High Performance Programme. So oh, it, this, this, was lottery fun, this was lottery funded. So that just meant a big increase in terms of the amount of support and uh, coaching that they could deliver. So from then it was six times a week and, and it was never looking back. From that age, six times a week, and that was so that that lottery funded. So what do you call? What was that called? Did you say? So it's so, called the, the Junior High Performance Program. Does it still exist? No, sadly not. Well, so there there probably is an element of it, but it won't be the same amount of players. So that was sixteen players from across under thirteen to under nineteen. So they might have had a couple of people in each age group. Uh, I think there was a few more in mine because it was it was there was quite a lot of depth in that age group. So just across that that age. That is, so time, all, are you uh, talking about like sixteen people all over Scotland at that time? <laughs> yeah, I mean it went up to as far north as Inverness. I think Paul Carey was from there. I might I might be wrong, but he was he used to come. So we'd have at least one session together a week at Scotston. Uh, so on a Saturday we were literally. Trained in the morning, lunch break, and then I remit. I think we did a conditioning session, then played again. So it was almost all Saturday, as we all got together. But it mainly was from the group that would be in the east. So we would train at Meadowbank with some of the different age, uh, some of the guys at different ages, and then the the guys in the west would train at Scotston, and then we'd come together uh, at the weekend. And, and what what fascinates me is that. Kind of a common theme, same as Jordan. Really, there was no, no real club badminton. It was a career from a very early time, and she just seemed to have trained with her dad a lot, and then went to proper training a lot. But it, this, I don't know if it's a common theme that there's not. It didn't really start with club, or did it with you? Did you? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, in Scotland, probably not. I think if you were speaking to someone in Denmark or Germany or one of those countries, they are club setups a lot more structured. There's a lot more that goes into it. And a lot of the guys will just train at their local club and there's enough people to drive competitive the level. Yeah, enough people to drive the level. Whereas I think in Scotland, if you really want to excel at it and try and make something of it, you almost have to go come together to get that to get that competition with each other, uh, so I think that's why it naturally happens. There isn't so much of a a club setup, which is a shame. It's it's more the I, I guess the closest you'd get to it was with the county Bampton. So we would go away a lot. I remember those trips a lot when I was a kid, uh, going down to uh, Yorkshire and Whitley Bay uh, down in Newcastle and stuff like that. I, th- I think that's, I mean, I guess just as a hobbyist player myself, you think, um, I grew up playing badminton. It was always club badminton, regular, three times a week, and then training on Saturday and leagues on Sundays. And so I played a lot growing up. Um, but it was, the, it was the hobby. You know, I was at school at night, I would go, and then on a Saturday I would go because it was the weekend, and then Sunday I could do whatever. Um, but very much what you're mm-hmm. describing is you've kind of been picked out as exceptional and then you've kind of your daytimes have been. Was it daytime? Were you you're training at night? I suppose you still had school, right? Yeah, still. Unfortunately, still had to go to school. Uh, I suppose what I'm saying is that it wasn't. It, <laughs> when was it social, Martin? When was it a good laugh? I I can't remember it being ever social. <laughs> really? uh, yeah, I mean, just from such an early age, I think because we had tournaments at from under ten yeah. and. I was, I think, quite competitive, and from day one, I can always remember just wanting to be, wanting to win the tournaments and and uh, get to finals and keep pushing myself. And it was always what's next, what's next. And yeah, I mean, it was always fun. Uh, don't get me wrong; like we had had a great time playing because essentially at the end of the day, 
the guys that you're training with every day are some of your best friends. Yeah. So it's not necessarily thinking about it as just it was business professional. It was you're having a laugh with your friends. It just happens that it almost uh, becomes like a military thing. Point. Do you think? Do you think it becomes like a military thing when you're in a troop together and you're all kind of you're in together, you're staying together, you're training together, you're there together, and you become one thing, going through the same emotions, the same. I suppose that you become a big unit, right? Yeah, I guess you do, and everyone understands each other in terms of what, like you're saying, what you've been through and what you've had to sacrifice in terms of, I guess that's the thing when you're a kid at uh, high school, for example, you'd you'd miss out on a lot of the things that normal kids would do uh, because you'd be away at the weekend straight after school, you'd be going to training. Uh, I just feel, I look back and think it's incredible how, how much sort of travelling about that you just took for granted that my parents and particularly like my mum uh, during the week would just be ferrying my brother and I about and you'd be you'd be up in arms if, if she was five minutes late and you were going to be late for training and stuff like that when you and then when you look back at it you're like geez that's some, that's, that's some so commitment cool. I know well yeah. Jordan was telling me that um I think they had like it was like four hours to get anywhere. They were like spending hours. His da dad was working 80 hours a week to pay for the travel and da la 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 la. It's really, it was really interesting. As you say, the, I mean, I think when I spoke to your dad, he said that I think you had training on Saturday and then Michael had training on Sunday. Is that right? Yeah, I think, uh, I, think I was pretty much all Saturday and my, the squad Michael was in was all Sunday. So uh, we managed to separate them nicely for them to well, get, okay. rack up the mileage on the. <laughs> Over the weekend, <laughs> I like it. That's brilliant. And um, okay, let's see. Um, so your first coaching was that with Dougie? Do you reckon it was with? Um, wasn't Dougie Walker? Was it? Who was it? Your first coach, officially your coach, I suppose. Oh, well, I reckon my first individual coach. So, I, like I said, there would have been Douglas Walker, Irene Blair, Bob Mackay, uh, and there'll, there'll be many more. But I, I reckon in terms of when I really picked it up and. Uh, was in, doing the individual trainings. It would have been Kenny Middlemas. Right. So he was he was ex most capped Scotland player uh, to yeah, to play badminton. So pretty fortunate in that he was my first coach, and then we just ran through the whole way through uh, my junior career with him. So uh, it was pretty fortunate that that he was my first one and uh, got yeah. lucky with uh, getting him as a coach early on. What was his, um, I spoke to Andy Cook yesterday and he was <laughs> very physical. Uh, what was your experience of getting coached? Was it was it a lot of drills? Was it physical, hard, hard work? What was it? What did it Yeah, I mean, Kenny was always a man of, uh, if you ever speak to anyone about what Kenny was like as a player, he was a physical, physical type of style of player, very consistent. Uh, which meant my training sessions were probably like you're saying in terms of a lot of drills, repetition. Uh, and I remember a lot of the time we would do, so, so a lot of the time we'd have two hour sessions and the last half an hour session, we'd go to the track at Meadowbank. So on a Monday night, it's probably not the not the thing that you want to be doing as a kid. I think they were eight to 10 sessions, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And the last half an hour were in the track, the indoor track doing shuttle runs, plyometrics. So he was big into that. And I mean, it's the, th the things that you don't really necessarily want to do, but when you look back, those are the things that separated you sometimes and some of the things that uh, really made a big difference getting that type of training early in, uh, early on the doors. And uh, yeah, he, he helped massively, but I was probably not always happy about doing it, but certainly certainly made a big difference in the I was, was going to ask you, I mean, how do you get motivated for something like that? Do they say, look, Martin, if you want to be a world-class player, if you want to play internationally, if you want this to be your career, you're going to have to do this. Is that how it goes? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent. I'd, I've got, I do remember vividly one time, so Kenny was a big runner, and uh, when over the summer of training session, that tends to be when you do a lot of your physical work because there's not as much need to be hitting as much yeah. so it's not quite as enjoyable i always enjoyed playing a lot more than uh, doing the off-court stuff yeah and i remember we went running so medibank's right next to uh some yeah. tough terrain if you like oh yeah uh, the, um, what do you uh, call the, the arthur seat arthur seat, arthur seat. Uh, yeah. so I, I remember we ran for about half an hour away from medibank and we got to 
around Arthur's seat and I was like, how are we getting back? Like, like what's the chat? And he was like, we're running. And I was just, I almost started to cry because uh, <laughs> the whole time I was just chasing him and I was pushing so hard. And then the thought of thinking, I've got to do this all again. But he was just like, no nonsense, let's go. And I think it was good for me because it really, it really trained me to be disciplined and just, just like train really hard in terms of just go through the pain and and uh, and not not give up to these such, sorts of situations. So, and do you I have think, that now, Martin? Do you have that own discipline now? I think well, it's been built from a junior career, and it's just transitioned into everything that you do. And I think those were the first early stages of learning what it was to be a professional in terms of he'd done it, he'd been played for Scotland at the level that I wanted to play at. So I think I always just knew, well, this is what needs to be done. So because I, I knew he'd been so successful, yeah. I think yeah. there was always, I always just trusted and believed in what he was setting me. Not that I always, yeah. not that I always uh, liked it, but it was always, it just had to be done. And I think I got exposed to playing uh, outside of Scotland quite early on, going down to England, playing abroad. And I think when you see those guys and see the level that they're playing at, it pushes you to know that you need to keep training hard and that that's what drives you and motivates you. And at the end of the day as well, I loved, I loved playing. So it wasn't always, it wasn't always uh, difficult in uh, pushing yourself. Sometimes you just enjoy playing. How important was it? I just I had a conversation yesterday with Andy Cook, who's a, um, a really well exp- experienced and respected coach, um, and he wasn't a great player. In to his own admission, he loved it and he was very very competitive. <laughs> but he and and that so the question I put to him was, how did he, how did you feel about people that would come to you that said, well, you're not very good. How could I possibly? I mean, you obviously, Kenny Middlesmiths, you, you looked right up to him because he'd played everything. Without that, do you think he would have done as well? What do you, how do you think about that? How much of it was about the fact that he had done it, I suppose? That's a tough one because I guess when I was training with him, I could always be, in terms of when it was one-on-one sessions, we could have, he, he sparring with me, we're playing matches. So I did get a lot from playing against him from a really young age when he was just like, I was just getting beaten after beaten after, like he was just every week. I was I was not at the same level as he was. And then as I got older, gradually, I, I can still remember the court where I first beat him. Really? In uh, yeah, just because I'd been, it'd been years that I was really? playing him and just getting battered and battered. And then eventually got to a stage where the first time I beat him, uh, which was nice. I, I had the same with my dad, but we never played very much after the first time I beat him. Uh, <laughs> funny enough. So he's got a much better record on me than uh, than I do on him. Oh, I see. Uh, That's but, coming, right? Yeah. Yeah. How, however, having said that, I don't believe that you need to have played at the top level or at a very high level. Someone like, like what you were saying there with Andy, I think that that a lot of, there's a lot of great coaches out there that haven't necessarily played at a higher level than the guys that they're coaching, but they may be being around a lot of great coaches That's... or watched a lot of Bampton and trained a lot of people. So yeah. it's getting a bit of a, I think, if they can't necessarily spar with you and train with you, then it's bringing in some of the guys to hit with you because it is so important with Bampton, you can't just be hitting multi shot or you need to be playing against someone. And I think that's where countries like Denmark and over in Asia, they've got so many players yeah. to play against when they're just in their internal training programs that it just drives performance so that uh, they all get to a much higher level so that when they play other countries, they're, they're already ready to, to play at that, that level. And they're already, I mean, yeah, so when you go away on these tours and that kind of thing, do you see that? How is it compared to yours? So, what do you, when you go to these tournaments and you're all over the world and you see other people training in the training rooms and all that kind of thing? Are the who are the who are the biggest trainers? Would you say is that the Asians? Do they do? Are they never off the court? Or do, you know, like hours and hours and hours and hours, or what is it like compared to you? Do you think, oh. God, I'm not like that? Or it's it's a tough one to say because. 
I think the British, like the English guys and the Scottish, we are always ones that are doing a lot of training. I think maybe sometimes because we don't have as many people to hit with, we need to be making sure that we're putting in the hours and we're quite physical players because we don't maybe necessarily yeah. have the same yeah. skill set as some of the Asian players because of... the back foot a wee bit, really. A wee bit on the back foot, do you think? I mean, different skill sets, shall we say. Uh, but I think, yeah, you're right in that when you go to tournaments abroad, like you'll see the, the hours that the Asians train are just insane in terms of never off core. I think but it'll be more about when they're not in tournaments that they'll be tra- their training hours are really ramped up and they're they're incredible incredible athletes and and have these crazy training regimes but then when it's when you get to tournament see, tournament time it's more about just fine tuning things and making sure that you're getting a hit in the hall because all the work's been done it's just about making sure you're match ready and and ready to go so i would say the japanese are definitely the loudest if you're in the training halls yeah do you, what I was going to ask you about did you learn about peaks <laughs> Andy Cook was talking about peaks. Did you do that? Training to a peak. So you'd say you'd have a peak, which is a tournament that you particularly wanted to win. And you, you played in other tournaments in between, but there was the one that you actually really, really wanted, you know, whether it be, I don't know, the biggest tournament you'd go to. Um, did you work on that basis? Did, did your coach say, right, we're going to train up to X? Or what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I think it was good for us in that a lot of that training in terms of uh, uh, preparing for the bigger tournaments, trying to peak for certain tournaments was done for us. It was already naturally factored into our training schedules that we were given. Uh, I think when you get to senior, when you're at junior, it's more about, I do remember like the, the junior nationals were always huge tournaments for everyone, just because everything in terms of the programmes that I was telling you about are picked on that. The Scotland teams are picked based on uh, how you do at the junior nationals? It certainly was at my at my age. Uh, it might have changed now, but I think you would. It would be more so in senior senior level. You would have a few tournaments because you can't you can't peak for every tournament you play. You might play fifteen to twenty tournaments a year, and it's just not possible to be at your top level because you need to taper down. But during the tournament season, I mean, you could play a tournament every week if you wanted. So. I think for me, the biggest ones that I do remember in terms of that we fully tapered in for were like a World Champs or Commonwealth Games were the ones that you really noticed that you had maybe two months before it that was really, really focused training in terms of your hours would change, how much hitting you'd be doing just so that you were tapering in for that tournament. I mean, it doesn't always work as well. It's crazy how, uh, I mean, there'll be so much science behind well, you'd it. you one in between that you didn't expect to. You're just kind of training up to a certain one. There'd be one in yeah. between, I guess, and you could do well in that, right? Yeah, because, I mean, so much of it's the mental side to it. And sometimes you build something up in your head yeah. so yeah. much and that you've been preparing for it for so long mm-hmm. that when you get to it, you can be in the best physical state that you want to be. But at the end of the day, you've got to deliver and be calm under pressure and perform. And sometimes a tournament that you didn't necessarily want to peak for uh, because you relaxed, you ended up winning that tournament. So it's, it's a funny old game and I guess it's why people are drawn to watching sport because anything can happen. Yeah. Did you ever, it's going slightly off topic, but did you ever think, did was the defining moment where you said to yourself, this is what I want to do every day, all day, when I'm finished school and when I'm finished you know, I want to be, well, at what point do you say, I want to be a professional bumble? And also Jordan was talking about a conversation where she was sat down at the age of 10 and said, a 12, and said, um, right, okay, if you want to be a professional bumble player, that's fine. You're going to have to focus on it. But just to let you know, this is what's going to have to happen. This is what's going to have to do. We're going to have to work. We're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. If you're committed to it, we will do that for you. Um, but you need to tell me now, are you committed to it? Did you have that with your dad? or? Uh, I think I think the closest to that at a junior would have been when this the high performance programme got put in place. So that would have been 12, 13 at that time. And that would have been a huge commitment because that suddenly went from you're picking when you're going to train and going to different club nights to 
you are expected to train six times a week. You're expected to come through to Glasgow once a week, commit into X amount of tournaments. Also a huge financial burden on your parents, something that you don't necessarily think about as a kid. Uh, and then I think going senior, it was always, it was never like, right, I'm going to play full time for the next 10 years. It was almost like one year at a time because in sport, you never know what's going to happen. You have no idea how you're going to do at senior level, injuries wise, funding rise. There's so many different variables that come into play in terms of making sure that you can be a full time athlete. So I wouldn't say it was always just maybe one or two years at a time. And I think the Commonwealth Games were huge focuses that kept that four year cycle alive a little bit. But it was always, yeah, it was, there's a lot of different factors that come into play. So when you, when it just, uh, I think I'm going to wrap up fairly soon, Martin, if that's okay, because I've just, I, I would love to come back and do it again, if that's okay. And just because I want to talk about university and, and future and, and I'm still, they've got loads of stuff I want to talk about, but I'm just interested in um, what your relationship now is with, is with badminton at that time. And um, you're, you're going and you're doing the training and every minute of the time, you know, every minute you've got, you go into training and coaching and that, did it stop being fun? <laughs> did it stop being? <laughs> did it stop being a good laugh? Because you've never went to clubs. You never went to Western. You never went. Did you ever go to clubs ever? So I, I did go to Western maybe for one or two years when I was. So I would train on a Thursday with Kenny for a couple of hours, and then I would sometimes hop on it because they would train uh, from eight till ten, I think it was, because it was my uncle that runs it. So he was obviously keen for me to come along and so is my dad but I think they were always really good with not pressurizing me into doing things that I, that were out with my commitments because knowing that I was already training six times a week so and true. so hard to just keep adding more and more sessions on so I would quite often go and hit with some of the guys uh, some of the older guys which was that was really good to have that competition and play against them but I think maybe only one or two years at Western. But going back to what you said, I think uh, it all comes back to what I said before in terms of a lot of the guys that I've trained with are now my best mates, some of my closest friends, guys that I enjoyed spending a lot of time with. And at the end of the day, I can't really complain about uh, getting to play badminton as a career for about 10 years. So I think there, you always have the ups and downs. There's times, don't get me wrong, when you're getting up at quarter past six, six in the morning to go to sessions that you're like, this isn't too fun, but you you always are focused on the end goal, knowing that you need to do it if you want to, if you want to try and do something at, at, at Bamington. So it, it never really got to that point. I think if I'd ever got to that point, I would have just said, right, this isn't for me anymore, because at the end of the day, you have to enjoy what you're doing. You ha it has to be fun, but it's not always going to be fun when you're playing playing elite sport, I guess. Yeah, what's interesting yeah. for me is it was never really, although it was when you were very young, you used to go and have a laugh and play with it, but quite young, you took it quite serious, or it was quite serious for you. It was never, like I say, I don't know how many people would say, you know, they've been a hobbyist and they've loved it and they've played it as a kid and they were, you know, they played it at school and la, 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 la. You, you've been quite serious for quite a long, from, from an early age, right? Most most people would probably say they've developed from a hobbyist player to want to be a professional, where I feel like you've been a professional, <laughs> maybe because of that junior academy, the junior, because the programme um, that was quite serious from an early age, which is great. I've done it wrong. It's great. But from a, from a hobbyist perspective... It's alien. It's an alien exactly. thing, right? Because people that like play badminton want to go and play badminton when they're not at work, right? Where badminton is your work, right? Is that about yeah, yeah. a fair summary of it, probably? Um, so when when your pals will say, when people that you know will say, I want to get a game sometime, you go, oh, geez, it's not badminton again. <laughs> yeah, well, to be fair, they're selective about a lot of guys, a lot of my friends might say that, but whether they actually want to play is, is another matter. Uh, it was it was always good fun at school. Um, P, you could show off. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was always a good laugh. Uh, and people liked having a hit with you and stuff like that. But yeah, outside of actually training, 
and competing. Yeah, you're not you're not going down to play badminton for a bit of a laugh too much, which is I guess what you're saying. But at the end of the day as well, it was we had a good time great training. Time, great time, and sure. grab on the buzz. So don't feel too sorry for me. No, I definitely no, I definitely don't. I'm just saying it's a different experience. Right. Look, yeah, let's, yeah, let's wrap up with that. And we're gonna come if okay, if it's okay, I wanna come back again. Because I've got definitely. I've got so much to ask you about. So I hope you I hope that was okay for you. Um, happy, yeah, I'm happy, more than happy to do that and Thank enjoy chatting to you. Thank you.